Here's what we know so far. Safalo Saipov is 29 years old. We know he was born in Uzbekistan. We know he came to the U.S. legally seven years ago. Here's, however, something we don't know, and that is probably crucial to all of this, how he became radicalized in those seven years in which he was legally in the U.S. Lots of questions on that front. We've reached Ali Sufan as we look for answers. He's the CEO of the Sufan Group, a former FBI supervisory special agent as well, and we have uh, got hold of him in New York. Uh, Ali, fascinating story here. From the point of view of the investigators and the attacker, we've talked with another FBI former agent about how the investigation will go, but I want to focus on this Mr. Saipov. What do, will they know about the attacker so far? Well, I think you mentioned a lot of the stuff that uh, we know. He's from Uzbekistan. He came here about uh, seven years ago. Um, it seems that he was radicalized wow. while in the United States, so he was not a radical when he came uh, to the United States. Uh, there are a lot of indications that he was active on social media, um, you know, um, watching and uh, um, reading a lot of the um, ISIS uh, propaganda. So uh, it seems more and more that he has been inspired uh, by the message of ISIS. Uh, interestingly enough, um, we experience some kind of uh, um, uh, membership from Uzbekistan of people who went and joined ISIS. There's about 1,500 foreign fighters from Uzbekistan who joined the conflict zone in Iraq and Syria, some of them fighting uh, with ISIS. Uh, and this is not the very first time uh, that ISIS used somebody from Uzbekistan uh, in their terror. We've seen that in Sweden in an attack very similar to the attack that we saw yesterday. Uh, which killed four um, uh, people. Uh, and also, we've seen that in Turkey, well, uh, few attacks to include the uh, club attack on, uh, I think, the Reina club attack uh, on the eve of 2017, the New Year's Eve. Um, uh, it was also conducted by an Uzbek. Uh, so it's an interesting to see this um, high level uh, involvement of people from Central Asia. We just did a report. Um, in our center here mm -hmm. on foreign fighters. And the number one region that, contrib that contribute fighters to ISIS in Iraq and Syria is the former Soviet Republic, to include Uzbekistan. So would it be safe to say that your group can connect the dots here in this case? And, and investigators would have that information as well that you mentioned, you know, more than 1,500 Uzbek nationals traveled to Iraq and Syria as would be foreign fighters for ISIS. They would keep that in mind. Would they be connecting the dots? Yeah, absolutely. And I think we have uh, still a lot of questions unanswered. I'm sure during uh, the interview uh, that he, uh, that the, the FBI will do with him, um, they will probably get a lot more information. But also, I think there are a lot of things, a lot of dots to be connected, not only in the United States, but internationally. Um, was he related to somebody who joined um, uh, ISIS uh, and, uh, let's say, he was killed and, uh, you know, uh, fighting for the so-called Islamic State? State. Is he connected to people back home who are sympathetic to terrorist groups or to ISIS? Uh, is there any kind of connection uh, with the Islamic State or the so-called Islamic State in Iraq and Syria? Uh, did they order the attack or mm -hmm. was he just inspired uh, by the message. Uh, these are all very important questions to answer. And I believe that the investigators, just based on the evidence uh, of talking to him, on interviewing others, um, on um, reaching out, uh, maybe doing forensic of um, all the data, uh, social media footprint that he has, I think they will probably be able to put a very good picture soon. And they've probably got a team working on just that right now, on the radicalization aspect of it. How, signif how significant is it, Ali, that it appears, from what we know right now, that this individual was radicalized domestically in the United States? Yeah. Well, most of the terrorist attacks that we had in America were people who were, um, you know, radicalized domestically in the United States. We don't have, uh, in the last decade or so, people who came from overseas to conduct a terrorist attack in America. I think we have a very good system in place that can detect these individuals. So most of the attacks have been inspired uh, by, by foreign terrorist organization, not really directed by a foreign terrorist organization. We've seen that in Orlando. We've seen that in San Bernardino. We're 
we've seen that in other terrorist, uh, you know, uh, arrests, plots, and attacks that actually took place. So, um, you know, we're fighting here a message, and mm -hmm. that message does not require a visa. That message cannot be banned by a travel ban. Um, that message require people to feel that they are part of the society and require us to conduct the counter uh, terrorism operations we have from a political perspective and from an operational perspective to be directly in sync with our values, with our diversity, um, with who we are as a nation. Um, this know, is, uh, this is our, our biggest weapon against terrorism. I'm wondering, though, if we're looking at this as a, a battle against ideology, and I, and I believe you're correct in that, how do you tackle that? Is it, is it about trying to win the hearts and minds of, and we've certainly heard that tactic before? Well, you know, we hear it, but are we acting upon it? Um, you know, so far, if you look uh, since 2001, since um, the, the, the war against terrorism, mm -hmm. global terrorism started, um, we did not have a strategy to deal with the whole issue of uh, countering the narrative, for example. And that cannot be done just by deleting a few tweets or flooding the media or social media with our own message. That has to be done based on policy, based on engagement, based on community engagement locally and internationally. It has to be done by empowering local voices voices to stand up against extremism, against terrorism. Unfortunately, this has been a missing component of, uh, of our strategy. Um, and uh, groups like ISIS, groups like Al-Qaeda continue to uh, hijack the name of a religion in order to, uh, you know, uh, claim that they are the defenders of religion, even though uh, they killed more Muslims than any other, um, you know, groups. Uh, they blew up mosques. They attack even the mosque of the Prophet himself in, in Medina during a holy month of mm -hmm. Ramadan. So these guys are really far away from claiming any connection to being the defenders of Islam, as they claim, and we need to show them as as hypocrites instead of telling them, yes, you know, they they they, they are what Islam is all about. Uh, so I, I think I, since 2016, we we really didn't have a strategy, mm -hmm. Sohana. A final question for you, Ali, and I know as a former FBI special agent, you're probably, when, when stories like this happen, there are parts of you that want to be right in there uh, doing some of that uh, work on the case. Uh, you're watching from the outside now, but you have a sense of what would be going on on the inside. What will you be looking for, the next information to come out that will be significant? I think if he is connected to other people in the United States who might act, um, that that will be probably the number one priority. Uh, number two, um, is he connected to people outside the United States? Was this attack inspired, or was it um, was it uh, you know directed by uh, by ISIS? Um, you know, uh, number three, um, was he part of a wider network, not necessarily domestically, but also um, internationally? Nationally. And number four, what are the things that fed into the radicalization, a process that we've seen with this uh, terrorist? I think all these uh, questions are extremely important to figure out uh, how we can prevent these things from happening down the road. I think the law enforcement and the intelligence agencies in the United States have been doing phenomenal job, very effective job. But unfortunately, Suhana, we have to be successful 100 percent mm -hmm. of the time. They have only to be successful once. And an attack like this, where you weapon daily life, um, it's, it's very hard to detect and it's very hard to prevent. Uh, I'm going to have to leave it on that note, but I, I want to thank you, Ali, and I hope you'll join us on the program again. Interesting to talk to you. Thank you. Thank Ali you. Sufan in New York. He is a former FBI special agent and now CEO of the Sufan Group.